world, we have. I'm glad we're doing that. Um, <laughs> among these worlds, we have approximately four. Okay, it's not advancing. No, that ruined everything. There we go. Oh, it went ahead. Okay, we have approximately five. Well, four. Four moons that uh, we consider ocean worlds. So these are moons where there are a variety of uh, types of evidence. We're pretty certain there are subsurface oceans underneath uh, an icy shell. But all of these worlds are places where people have suggested uh, that there are subsurface oceans for one reason or another. So this is a pretty diverse group of places. Now, of course, you all care a lot more about habitability. And so I wanted to draw some uh, connections from ocean worlds that I study to habitability that you all think about. So as you know, habitability is sensitive to the availability of energy inputs, rock water surface exchange processes, and temporal changes in all of these things. We also think that present day ocean worlds have the best chance of being inhabited uh, today among the worlds in our solar system. So the kinds of questions that I want to answer, which are related to the kinds of questions you probably think about, are what are the ocean, uh, what are the evolutionary pathways to ocean formation? What are the different ways we can form ocean worlds? What is the life cycle of an ocean world? What processes promote long-lived oceans that might be better for life? And how can we detect present-day oceans where we might look for life? So I'm going to start with Europa, the original ocean moon. I call it the hipster moon because it was doing it before it was cool. Um, we think that, so, so Europa is about the size of our moon, um, but it has more liquid water on it than we have on Earth. Most of that liquid water is contained in a thin uh, layer at the surface. The outermost portion is frozen and the innermost portion is liquid water. What makes uh, this moon so special is that it's in a dynamic resonance. So uh, here you see the orbits of Io on the uh, interior, then Europa and then Ganymede going around Jupiter. And if you stare at this for a while, other than getting dizzy, you'll also notice that Io and Europa align uh, at the same place every orbit. And then on the other side of Jupiter, uh, Europa and Ganymede align. And because these moons are constantly and consistently tugging on each other gravitationally, it keeps Europa's orbit from circularizing. Usually planets like to go from eccentric orbits to circular, but here these little gravitational kicks keep the orbits eccentric. Eccentricity is really, really important because in this figure, which is extremely not to scale, uh, you see that as Europa gets closer to Jupiter in its orbit, it is stretched more by the difference in gravity across the whole shape of Europa. When it's far away, that uh, pull collapses a little bit. And so you get this very technical squishing effect, um, which leads to heating and stress through a process we call dissipation. Also, if you have a tilt to the spin pole called obliquity, that can also cause the tidal bulge to shift in latitude about the equator. So you're basically taking this pattern and doing this. And the amount of heat and stress that you actually get out of this process depends on what the interior structure is like, what the materials are that it's made of, and the frequency at which you deform it. So we can make cool maps of tidal stresses. Uh, so on the left, you see um, how stresses change uh, throughout a European day, which is about 85 hours, three and a half Earth days. So there's always two principal stresses and uh, they're perpendicular to each other. And if you look at just one location, you'll see that they uh, circulate. Okay, so you can create stresses at different orientations throughout each day and each location experiences different stresses. On the other side, I'm showing a contour plot of the largest stress that you can get uh, on Europa per day. And so these stresses happen at different times of day, but you can see that you can actually get quite a lot of variation um, in what uh, stress could be fracturing the surface. So we use these maps to understand surface features, and then we can use the surface features to understand what's going on in Europa's orbit. So these uh, features are called cycloids. I can even reach it. This one right here, this one here, and there are a bunch up there. These are really interesting features because they're unique to Europa. We don't see them on any other uh, bodies in the solar system. And their patterns are specifically tied to how tidal stress changes with time. So I've got a cool little movie. So you'll watch that vector move along. That vector represents the tidal stress. So you have a small stress, 
it's getting bigger, eventually it breaks the surface, the fracture takes off, but as it's moving, the orientation of the stress changes, and so you follow a curved path. So we've been able to use this to reproduce um, observed cycloids really, really well. So here, um, the black dots are those cycloids that we see up there, and the colored lines are tidal models using slightly different um, orbit models. So for those of you who are graduate students, I think it's like 90% of you, this was four years of graduate school. <laughs> That's good. Um, so yeah, fear not. So in the time that I was in graduate school working on Europa, luckily we had the Cassini mission, which flew by Saturn and found more targets for me to think about. We have here Enceladus. Now you'll notice first that while it looks really big, it's really, really small moon, right? 500 kilometers across. This is very tiny. Normally we think of small objects like this as not being very interesting because we would expect them to cool off quickly and then not have any activity going on. But Enceladus surprised us. You can see even at this scale that there are regions with uh, heavily fractured terrains. There's a lot of cool stuff going on. And then some uh, gravity measurements and other data told us that Enceladus is a global ocean moon. So it's like Europa in that the ocean is completely connected everywhere, but the ice shell seems to be varying in thickness from thinnest at the South Pole to thickest at the equator and then in the middle at the North Pole. Why that is, we're still working on. So unlike Europa, where we see the same kinds of features everywhere, on Enceladus, it's really, really uh, different. It's really variable. So this is a picture of the North Pole and right here, you can see more craters than I've seen on Europa entirely. Okay, this is a much older surface than anywhere you see on Europa. Whereas here on the right at the South Pole, this is as young as anything I've ever seen on Europa. And the types of features that we see are quite similar um, in the South Pole. So we have a really variable set of things going on on Enceladus. Another really cool thing that Enceladus has is plumes. So those long stripes, long fractures called the tiger stripes, actually have active jets. They were observed through the entirety of the Cassini mission, so at least 11 years. And we think that they source a ring around Saturn, which means that these have been going for at least 60 years, because that's as long as we've observed that ring. So most likely this process has been going on over geologic time. We can see here, this is the orbital phase of Enceladus. So it's where in Enceladus orbit is. And if you wrap the data of how much stuff is coming out of those plumes, you can see that it has a repeating pattern where sometimes in the orbit it has much higher flux and at other times it has much lower flux. We think that this is related to tides, but we don't understand how tidal uh, flexing of the shell is controlling this pattern. We also looked at how the fractures themselves form. So you can see I pulled out data points of the tiger stripe fractures. We looked at the orientations of those tiger stripes and we compared them to tidal stress and it turns out that they match identically. So tidal stresses controlled how the orientations of those fractures uh, formed and then all the stuff coming out of them is further modulated by tides. So again we have a process uh, related to tides. So just from looking at these two ocean worlds we can start to put together a picture of what ocean worlds look like. So they have heavily fractured surfaces at least in some regions their fractures align with tidal stresses. They have pretty few craters due to active or recent resurfacing. Oh, thanks. I like the dance, but it's okay. Um, they tend to have eruptions or surface flows. Uh, they have high heat flows or evidence of melting processes. And typically moons and eccentric close in orbits will have a lot of this activity because they have tides that can drive uh, high heating and stress. And then we get to Mimas. This moon is about the same size as Enceladus. It orbits closer to Saturn. It has a higher eccentricity. And it's not in any kind of resonance that would keep that eccentricity high. Sorry, I don't know. I didn't know I animated that, so it tripped me up. So when we look at this moon, what we see is that Mimas must not have dissipated very much energy through tides because the eccentricity would damp and without a resonance to keep it up, there would be no, no eccentricity left. So when we look at Mimas, we immediately think, okay, well, it hasn't done much 
right? So either its eccentricity is really, really recent, or it has never dissipated energy, which in implies that it's been frozen for a really long time. We also see that there are no surface expressions of past or present oceans. It's heavily cratered. There's very few tectonic features. You don't see anything like an eruption. Uh, I'll explain this more in a moment, but there's very limited crater relaxation, which limits the heat flow. So the geology is just completely inconsistent with the other ocean moons that we know about. And again, because it orbits closer than Enceladus with a higher eccentricity, it should actually be more tidally active than, Mimis, uh, than Enceladus or Europa, but it isn't. And so that tells us something is going on. And the thing we have been uh, assuming is going on is that Mimas is frozen and always has been, so it just can't respond to those high tides. Whereas if you put an ocean in it, the ocean can respond and create heat and, and stress. We also see no heat signatures of an internal ocean. So craters, uh, when you form a crater in an ice shell and then you allow heat to come through that shell, it relaxes the crater and creates uh, a more muted topography. And so here on the left, we have some pictures of Enceladus where you can see that the craters are kind of flat floored, a little bit mushy looking almost. And this is a model where somebody said, okay, well, what is uh, what kind of relaxation does that imply? That's all these black dots. And they used a model to try and fit how much relaxation had occurred. And what they found was that you had to have very large amounts of heat flow through the surface for a long period of time in order to get the craters to relax. So lots of heat, craters relax. Similarly, on this moon Dione, there are places with the red dots where it implies very high heat flows because the craters are very relaxed. There are other places where you have low heat flows. But again, the take home is high heat flows, relaxed craters. Okay, so, oh, I guess I didn't say the important thing here, which is Mimas doesn't have relaxed craters, right? So um, we don't have a lot of topographic data for Mimas, but of what is there, those craters do not look like they've been heated up for a long period of time. So it's hard to reconcile that idea with an ocean being kind of kept alive through tidal heating when there's no heat going through the ice shell. Okay, and finally, we have to think about how Mimas form. So it turns out that it's, it's very unlikely that Mimas is a primordial moon, by which I mean it formed and has stayed as it, as it was since it formed initially, okay? It's much more likely that it either formed not out of basic accretion or was disrupted. And there's a few reasons for this. First of all, Mimas orbits very, very close to the rings of Saturn. So close that the rings themselves can have a gravitational uh, impact on Mimas and push its orbit outward. If the rings and Mimas coexisted for more than a billion years, Mimas would already have moved farther away than it is. So that tells us that Mimas is probably a billion years old or younger. Also, because Mimas orbits very close, it's very small, uh, impactors that come in towards Saturn are super accelerated and hit with a lot of energy. And so people have studied how likely it is that Mimas would survive and not just get like pummeled like crazy. And it turns out it wouldn't. So all of these things are pointing to a fairly young age for Mimas. And there are a few formation models that look into this. One is that all these moons, sorry, MIMS is mid-sized icy moons of Saturn, that they uh, accreted after catastrophic collisions. So everything went kaboom, they re Another model, which I think is really cool, is this ring model where a rocky ring particle uh, begins to move outward through the rings and collects ice. So this is an important one because you uh, predict a differentiated Mimas where you have a rocky interior and an icy exterior. And then we have one <clears throat> where a Titan-like body uh, was impacted and chunks of it flew off and became the mid-size icy moons. Um, and if you have any other crazy ideas, there's definitely room for more crazy ideas. Uh, but there are no obvious pathways from these formation models to oceans because there's no heat source. When you accrete late, there's no radiogenic uh, material. And so there's just not an obvious way that we can form oceans. So all of this tells us clearly there's no ocean in Mimas. Talk over, we all go home. <sighs> So the Cassini spacecraft measured this slight wobble of Mimas relative to the direction of Saturn. That's called a libration. 
Librations are very, very sensitive to the interior structure of the moon, and there are only two ways to explain the libration. Either you have a weirdly shaped core surrounded by an ice shell, or you have a liquid water ocean under a relatively thick ice shell. In either of these cases, Mimas has to be a differentiated moon, which conflicts with our original idea that Mimas formed and stayed frozen and didn't do anything interesting. Something had to lead it to be differentiated. And further analysis of the libration seems to favor the ocean model. It's very annoying. So when this paper came out, <laughs> I said, there's no way Mimas is an ocean world. I wrote a paper about how it is in an ocean world. Anyway, um, but I got to thinking, uh, you know, I'm a scientist and I can't just decide that this is wrong. Like what could really be going on? And so I came up with this sort of map of, of things. In order for Mimas to be an ocean world, first we have to have tidal heating that can maintain an ocean with a thick shell. And that's actually, oops, sorry. That's actually hard because you have a high eccentricity and you're really close. So it's easy to make a lot of heat and then melt your ice shell completely. So that's the first thing. Can we even do that? And then, oh, I keep pushing the wrong button. The tidal stresses with an ocean should at least be comparable to Enceladus and Europa, which are heavily fractured. So we'd have to come up with a way to not fracture Mimas. Oh, goodness. Then we need to be able to preserve craters, right? We need to somehow not have heat flows be so high that everything is relaxed because we don't see that. And we have to deal with this issue that the current models would imply Mimas is frozen. Although to be honest, they haven't really thought about it. So I made this little map and I thought, oh gosh, these are projects. I can do these projects. So I got this whole team of people working on all these projects. And now we have a whole research theme focused on is Mimas an ocean world? Okay, so the first, I'm gonna first talk to you about this uh, initial one, tidal heating. Then we're gonna talk a little bit about fractures. So the question we wanna ask, can tidal heating maintain a thick ice shell on Mimas or would it just completely melt? And so uh, an, a particular ice shell thickness is stable if the heat that's generated within the ice shell can be transported out within the same time frame. Right? So there's a balance between heat uh, being generated and heat going out. If you have too thick of a shell, there's so much volume of material that can dissipate heat that you would actually melt the shell to a thinner state. And if you have too thin of a shell, you can't actually generate enough heat and you freeze out. So we're looking for um, stable thicknesses with the current conditions of uh, Mimas. So to do this, we have some knowns. We know that the libration requires a specific type of ice shell. So those are the thicknesses that we're looking for. We also know the libration eccentricity and location of Mimas, which feed into the tidal model. And then we have some things that are a little bit less known. So the responsiveness of the shell will depend on its rheology, mostly its viscosity. And so we can, uh, we can set that. So we tested two. Maxwell is the rheology that most people use for ice, but the Andrade model is actually better at capturing the anelastic properties of ice. And so we also tested Andrade. We uh, determined what the bottom boundary condition was in terms of temperature and viscosity, which is just something that we don't know very well. So we picked two different values. And uh, our results are also affected by surface temperature, which thankfully is measured, but there is some variability across the surface. So we tested two different uh, temperatures. And I will say, so the underlying ones are the canonical case that I'm gonna show you. We consider these the most reasonable parameters. There's one more thing that we don't know, and that is the basal heating. So we have an ocean under this ice shell, and there could be some heat that's coming up from the ocean going into the shell. And there are basically no constraints on this number. So what we did is we decided to solve for it. If I want a shell that's 25 kilometers thick, how much heat do I need to pump into the bottom of the shell? It could be too high, it could be too low. We're not gonna pick a number, we're just gonna figure out what it is. And we prefer lower values because Mimas has a very low rock fraction which means it's probably not creating a lot of radiogenic heat and it's small, so it loses heat quickly. All right, so a bunch of nitty gritty details. So in order to address this problem, we had to create a new tool to model tidal heating because uh, we needed to consider Mimas's libration and we wanted to be able to uh, look deeply at the rheology of the ice shell. 
Most of the time people model these with only two layers in the ice shell, and that's not very good at approximating a conductive ice shell. So we decided to make a much more refined grid, essentially. Um, we call this multi-frequency analysis of tidal heating. So yes, we use math to do this work. Um, so we use this multi-frequency approach that allows us to do a libration. We have all of our layers. And then uh, an important thing to know is that if you look at a global picture of a moon and its tidal heating, it changes from location to location, just like tidal stress. So uh, in order to evaluate this process, we um, globally average all of the heat, come up with thicknesses that are stable, and then uh, that's how we do it with the, the heat transport model, because our heat transport is one dimensional. Okay, so a bunch of things here. So in each of these cases, the blue one is the initial condition that we set throughout the ice shell. Okay, so the ocean's over here, the shell base is here, the surface is here. So we have a temperature profile through the shell that corresponds to a viscosity profile through the shell. And then uh, we have a, a standard tidal heat that we're starting with and a heat flux from base to surface. The orange lines show what happens once we've reached steady state. So we allow the tidal heating to be generated, transported, and we let the whole thing evolve. And so you can see we get a spike. The spike of heat actually moves up a little bit in the body and we can change the heat flux. Okay, so here's the results. Frustratingly, the most plausible parameters make exactly the shell thickness that we observed. So, oh, did, did that not? Oh, there's a green box here that for some reason is not showing up on this screen. So the, what, we're, what I'm showing here, heat flux on this axis and shell thickness on this axis. Okay, so we have basal heating going into the ice shell. We have tidal heating being generated in the shell and we have surface heat coming out. So the basal heating is the blue line and the surface heat is the orange line. So if we pick a thickness, say 15 kilometers, it would suggest that to have stable ice at 15 kilometers, you need about 10 milliwatts per meter squared going into this, the base of the shell. You generate heat to get up here, and then uh, you have about 100 milliwatts per meter squared coming out of the surface. Okay. So everywhere there's a dot, that is a stable thickness for some basal heat flux. The uh, libration measurements, and this is the green box that you can't see, said that this has to be between 24 and 31 kilometers to fit the measurements. And an ice shell of 24 to 31 kilometers actually works beautifully. You can create those stable ice shell thicknesses with very low basal heat fluxes, and you can get a modest amount of heat coming out of the top. So this works wonderfully. Okay, so tidal heating in Mimis can preserve a thick ice shell over an ocean. But what does this mean for tidally driven fractures? So how can we avoid fracturing Mimas? So we have Europa as, a, as an example. Europa is obviously heavily fractured. Everything you see here is a fracture. In, when we look at Europa, when we look at the tidal stresses, they're pretty low, about 100 kilopascal. But if you take ice and you put it in a lab, it breaks at one megapascal. So that's really confusing. And we don't really know what it means. It could be that Europa's ice is different, or it could be that there's an additional stress that's acting with the tidal stress. So we're seeing 100, but there's some other background value that we're not accounting for that you could add to that. Okay. And so here, I'm sorry, this is a lot in one slide. This histogram is for locations on Europa in white and Mimas with a couple of different parameters in the other two colors. And so this is showing the levels of tidal stress across different locations. And the takeaway from this plot is that Mimas, Mimas's tidal stresses and Europa's tidal stresses basically overlap. So if you take Mimas and you put an ocean in it, you should stress it about as much as Europa. So again, why doesn't Mimas look like this if there's an ocean? And if you read that paper at the end, I'm like, doesn't have an ocean. So, but there's another option, which is what I was starting to explain, which is, okay, maybe it doesn't have an ocean, or maybe it does, but there's an additional stress that facilitates fracturing on Europa that is not present on Mimas. So what's going on with that? It turns out that if you have an ocean and you begin to freeze it out due to lower heating coming in or due to the orbit uh, expanding over time, you start to freeze that ocean out 
it creates high stresses where you get tension at the surface, you're pulling apart the shell, and you get compression at the base of the shell. And these stresses are many megapascals. They're much higher than tidal stresses. Because of that, you can create very deep fractures that can actually penetrate all the way to the ocean for some conditions. So for Europa, you can't get all the way there because the gravity is too high, but on Enceladus, you can. And we think that that's actually exactly how the plumes of Enceladus form, that a combination of cooling stresses and tidal stresses created deep cracks that uh, penetrated all the way to the ocean. And now we're seeing the ejection of ocean water. The challenge is Nemesis' gravity is even lower than Enceladus's. So if you are having a freezing ocean today, you would still crack, okay? So there's not a difference in tidal stresses that can explain why there's no fractures. And there wouldn't be a difference in cooling stresses if you had cooling stresses. Hmm. All right, so what have we learned? So first we've learned that thick ice shells actually can be maintained with really low basal heating and using really realistic parameters. We accounted for the libration that was measured in terms of tidal heating for the first tidal model to include libration. And we found that it did increase the amount of heat that was generated within Mimas. Our initial models actually produced way too much heat and can make ice shells as thick as six kilometers, which is very thin. Um, but switching to the more uh, realistic rheology really helped to solve that problem as well as uh, reducing the surface temperature. And then finally, this issue, Mimas' ice shell should be cracked if the ocean is presently freezing. But maybe what that's telling us is that the ocean is not currently freezing and that would solve the problem. So around August, I updated my thoughts about Mimas. Maybe it does have an ocean. So Mimas could be a young ocean world. If it's young, if it's a young ocean world, we can see the tidal heating is compatible with the present day observations of ice shell thickness. If the interior is warming, if the ocean is growing, that would help to avoid fractures because you don't have cooling stresses to get through that ice shell. Uh, if you have a recent ocean, you also don't have as much time to pump heat through the ice shell, so you're not going to be relaxing craters substantially, and that's consistent with our observations. But we still need to find a heat source for this recent ocean. And if Mimas truly has an ocean today, it tells us some really important things. First, it shows us that one of these evolutionary pathways uh, that we've, we've identified for Mimas can give you an ocean, but we don't know which one and we don't know why. And that's a really important uh, question to answer. We also know that we have a new category of ocean world that doesn't look like Europa, that doesn't look like Enceladus, that frankly looks like the least likely candidate for an ocean world. So how could we actually figure this out? So in this study, we found something we were not expecting, which is that an ocean moon will have a much higher surface heat flow than a frozen moon. And that kind of makes sense because if you have your ocean, you're creating heat in the ice shell. That's what's maintaining that ice shell and, and ocean. And so the heat has to be transported out. So what we found was that Aminas with an ocean had a surface heat flow of 20 milliwatts per meter squared, whereas with no ocean, it had only six. We also noticed, this is that same plot from before, but I zoomed in just on the surface heat flow. Now this is a log scale, so that's why I wanted to put the numbers up here. If your ice shell is very thick, 29 kilometers, your surface heat flow is 21. If it's 12 kilometers, your heat flow is 60. These are big differences. And so if you could measure the surface heat flow on Mimas, even to within 10 or 20 milliwatts per meter squared, you could not only determine whether there's an ocean, you could also determine the, the general thickness of the ice shell. And that would be really cool. Um, yeah. All right, so one more boring list of cool results. So it is possible that Mimas has an ocean today. Um, if Mimas does not have an ocean today, the best way to create a uh, Mimas that has a high eccentricity and is differentiated is that it's a ring-born moon, which is really, really cool. If we uh, have an ocean that formed recently, it helps satisfy some of these other observational constraints, like the lack of crater relaxation. Um, if the ocean is warming or even stable, it could avoid fracturing 
But that would imply that cooling really plays a huge effect on these other two moons by getting them to fracture. Uh, and finally, surface heat flow measurements may be sufficient to detect oceans and constrain ice shelf thickness. So next up for our group, we definitely want to evaluate other moons that maybe are further away or have lower eccentricities to see uh, how diagnostic surface heat flow measurements could be on moons that have less ability to dissipate tidal energy. We also want to go ahead and model those craters and see if the heat flow from, uh, from our models would relax them too much or is consistent. And finally, we want to investigate these formation scenarios a bit more or identify perhaps subsequent processes uh, that could generate a recent ocean. So my takeaway message here is that confirming or ruling out an ocean within Mimas is really critical to characterizing the overall habitability of the solar system and identifying ocean worlds. Because if this thing can be an ocean world, imagine what all these could be. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alyssa. We have plenty of time for questions. Oh, um, I saw you first. <laughs> um, so I was wondering, uh, are, is there or are there going to be any opportunities to measure surface heat flow? There? I'm so glad you asked that. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the Juno spacecraft at Jupiter is going to do some satellite flybys, and it has an instrument called a microwave radiometer. Um, and one of my uh, collaborators on these projects has a really innovative idea to use the microwave radiometer measurements to get surface heat flow from moons like Europa and Ganymede. And so I'm excited about the prospect of that. If it really works, then he's given us a tool that we could send all over the solar system to look for oceans uh, using surface heat flow. Yeah. So you're proposing that Mimas's ocean is recent. And I think that Enceladus, you know, the age of formation of Enceladus estimates vary from, I don't know, a billion, well, I guess, I guess from 4.5 billion to maybe a billion, or even as short as 100 billion years ago. So how recent is recent with your Mimas ocean? It's kind of a scaling adjective, which, oh. Yeah, <laughs> well, million, million? there's a lot to unpack there. So, <laughs> so first, uh, for people who aren't familiar with the age debate about the Saturnian moons, um, all of these, Mimas, Enceladus, Tethys, Dione, Rhea, the mid-sized moons, um, there's a huge debate. Uh, initially, they were thought to be four and a half billion years old. And then there was a paper written that said, hey, if you actually um, move all of these orbits back in time, and then you move them forward in time again, they get locked into resonances that they're not currently in. And in order to avoid getting in those resonances, they must be very young. And that's where the 100 million year number comes from. Um, the challenge with that paper is that at the time they did what everybody does, which that they, they assume that dissipation in Saturn has been constant over uh, the age of the solar system and that the number Q is very large, 80,000. Since then, um, people have measured the outward migration of the moons and shown that the Q of Saturn is more like 1500. So we can't use that constraint of 100 million years because it's based on this incorrect uh, Q value. Um, as for the the ages, I think a billion years, probably, um, for Mimas at least, because you need to uh, deal with the rings problem, um, that the, uh, the rings would move its orbit. So that's what you mean by recent is a billion? Well, the moon itself would be a billion years. For the, the ocean, the only way to figure out how long the ocean could persist is by doing the crater relaxation modeling, because it takes a certain amount of time to relax craters. So if we say, okay, an ocean would create 20 milliwatts per meter squared. Okay, well, it's gotta be there for a certain period of time. And eventually, if it's there too long, you're gonna relax the craters. So if my proposal gets funded, then <laughs> I'll be able to tell you how old is too old in order for the ocean to still to have and, been there. And yeah. just to follow up to that. So, so you're proposing that Mimas could have an ocean and for some reason it's not freezing. Could it be because it just has a peculiar geochemistry, like very ammonia rich or something, and so it's not. Yeah, it's it's, it's unclear why. That's kind of a thing that we're starting to think about. Um, but there's a bunch of things about the Saturn system that we don't see anywhere else, uh, which need more investigation. So the one that I'm most interested in is um, so we looked at Enceladus. Enceladus pumps out way more heat than it should. And so uh, there was a paper by James Roberts many years ago where he said, well, if the core of Mimas is actually 
ice and rock and porous. He said it was fluffy, he called it fluffy. So if they have a fluffy core, you can actually get dissipation happening in the core in ways that we don't usually think about. And so I'm curious about uh, a fluffy core in Mimas and at what point in time it would begin to be activated by tides. Maybe things are delayed. Yeah. If I understood right, the vibration observations could be explained by a frozen moon, but with a non-spherical mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and it, that doesn't strike me as so unlikely if it's a collisional fragment, but is there a reason to disfavor that? I mean, <laughs> In my 2017 paper, I said, that's definitely the explanation. <laughs> um, so there's a couple of things. So the first is that there was a later paper. So the Tajuddin paper was the Libration Observation paper. And they said, it's one of these two things. There was another paper um, by someone whose last name I will butcher, Noyes, Noyes, I don't know. And he looked at the phase of the Libration, um, which was something that uh, they didn't do in the initial paper. And he used that to further constrain the interior. And that paper says, ocean. So, you know, there's not necessarily a reason to disfavor the um, frozen model, but when we have evidence for an ocean, my thinking is like, okay, we got to rule that out, right? Like we, we can't just say it isn't, right? And so um, I actually got started working on Nemus to disprove that it is an ocean world. <laughs> so I was really frustrated actually when the tidal heating thing totally worked. Um, so now, I, now I'm sitting in the middle space and we'll see. Um, but I think it's important to, to keep in mind that whether it's frozen, but differentiated, or has an ocean, it has a lot to teach us about how it formed, the processes it's undergone, what it is. I mean, we don't know any other ocean, uh, ocean moons that look like this, and we don't know any other moons that are born from the rings. So either way, it's really a cool place. Does the uh, size and depth of the Death Star crater provide any constraints? I'm so uh, glad you asked that question. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's it. This must be the largest crater relative to the target size in the solar Yeah, it's huge. Um, it's a huge crater. So that's an excellent question because I thought the same thing. Like, why? How would you even make that crater? So there's two thoughts. First, um, so that crater is about 10 kilometers deep. So the ice shell is 10 kilometers or more. That's fine. It could have been deeper originally. <laughs> right, it could have been deeper originally. But the, the problem is the ice shell is so thick, right? So they're saying 30 kilometers. So, okay, fine. Um, I have a student who's working on this project. She uh, models impact basin formation. Um, and she's been modeling the formation of Herschel uh, from planetocentric debris. So in the Saturn system, we have two different sources. Of, of impactors. One is stuff going around the sun, like comets, um, which we know affects the Jovian system a lot. But we also have material that's somehow native to Saturn that's been beating up these moons. And there's lots of evidence that shows that that's a predominant population uh, within the system. And the big, big difference is that planetocentric material is slow and heliocentric material is fast. So what Adine found in her models was that if you have a slow impactor, you can totally make Herschel without breaking through a 25 kilometer ice shell. If you want to have a fast impactor, we, well, we broke the simulation. So we, <laughs> we have to go back and do it again. But um, yeah, unfortunately, that was my other one where I was like, I'm going to nail this. It's going to be clearly not, a, not an ocean moon. Um, yeah, it, it could be. Um, the other issue is if the ocean is recent, Herschel could predate it. So you may have had a frozen moon you impacted it to create Herschel and then later generated an ocean and then we wouldn't know. Yeah. Is it possible that that and other impactors might have provided the impetus to melt the ocean? So I'm, I love you guys. <laughs> um, yeah, that proposal got rejected on Friday. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so impact heating is an interesting beast because generally we think of impact heating as being a very quick process, and transient heat, you hit it, it heats up, and then it goes away. Um, but the interesting thing is when you add that heat, you also change the thermal structure and the viscosity of the ice shell. And since tidal heating is so sensitive to viscosity, you can actually start to generate tidal heat in the ice that, uh, that has been warmed up. And what we were hoping to investigate with this proposal is not just 
the formation of Herschel. But overall, if you're bombarding a moon heavily enough that the heat signature from one crater can't dissipate before the heat signature of another crater is imparted, maybe you can begin to get a like, global level increase in tidal heating. And that could potentially lead to melting or just enhanced heat for a long time. Um, so yeah, it's something I'm really interested in. We'll, we'll get there. Other questions? Are there any questions from online? Yeah, you can check it or you can see it. If you have a question online, yeah, type it in the chat. Oh, there are comments. Yeah. Yep. Why does it look like the Death Star? I, yes. Oh, good. We just answered that question. <laughs> yes, and Sierra points out that Odysseus is on Tethys and looks similar. And Yes, we don't know why there are big things either. Yeah, she, she answered great. This is Sierra is my grad student and now postdoc. Um, and she's been studying the moons of Saturn in a completely different way and finding just like really weird things about them. So look forward to her papers too. All right, so uh, oh, we have another question over here. Oh, I was gonna ask that kind of an exoplanet, but if you had all the money in the world and all the disposals would get funded on that, <laughs> uh, what would be your first research? That's a really good question. I mean, right now I'm really like, I've been sucked in to this moon and I feel like there are enough good questions to be asked where you can't just dismiss it, right? Crater relaxation, crater formation, like even the evolution models, how would you, how do you build a moon out of ring material? And if you do that, like how much thermal, you know, energy are you imparting and what is the temperature structure? And like a big impact, what does that have, uh, what kind of effect does that have on the eccentricity of the moon and all these kinds of things. So most of my proposals recently have been looking at um, how does a satellite system evolve and what are the different uh, processes that might affect whether oceans form or don't form. Um, so that's definitely what I would do. And I go visit Mimas. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll, I have Venmo. So if you wanna <laughs> contribute. <laughs> We're good. All right, well, we're gonna take Alyssa out for dinner tonight. Uh, so if any of you are interested in that, uh, please come down and let me know. Um, but otherwise, let's uh, thank Alyssa for a great talk. So funny, I was so afraid it would be too long. Okay, so many slides were really good. Yeah, a lot of words. <laughs> and then it was super short. <laughs> so, yeah. Good, good question, though. Yeah. Stop sharing. Yeah.